Joy News Prime. This is Joy News Prime here on Joy News on Multi TV, but also available across Europe on ABN Television. Coming up, the New Patriotic Party and others pushing for the compilation of a new voters register may yet see their wish come true as the Electoral Commission tasked IT experts to review it and the governing National Democratic Congress softens its stance on the matter. Lawyers for judges implicated in judicial corruption scandal cross-examining Anas Aramio Anas as Judicial Committee resumes its work. Parts of eastern region capital, Koforidia, submerged after a few hours of torrential rain. And in business with me, Abigail Adomakwenchi, the vessel to process crude oil from Ghana's second largest oil field tin should be setting off soon to Ghana after it was officially commissioned today in Singapore as FBSO Professor GEA Mills. Abigail Aduma can you be here in the next 30 minutes with all the business news. A special court to prosecute power thieves is set to have jailed 104 corporates already, with more soon to follow as the electricity company of Ghana steps up efforts to curb losses from non-paying consumers. Also coming up is sports entertainment, the interactive segment and international news. My name is Israel I. Stay tuned. The very first story, the Electoral Commission says it has engaged the services of IT experts to help review the country's electoral role. This followed demands by opposition New Patriotic Party for the compilation of a new voters register. Kwachi Afreniyama was there and asked more. The IPAC meeting had high-level representation from the various political parties, including the MPP, NDC, GCPP, and the PPP. Key on the agenda included the need or otherwise for a review of the voters' register and the outcome of the recent district-level elections. After the meeting, chairman of the NDC, Kotfi Potofe, says the party is now ready to listen to what other political parties have to say on the voters' register. And to everybody in this country, I'm sure that the opportunity is coming for everybody else who has some opinion on it, who has done some research, who thinks that uh, for the foreign match of this country in terms of elections um, can support with some ideas practically. I mean, it's good to have that public forum and let's be heard some more and then we can come to a firm conclusion. And yes. You were telling me earlier, before you entered the meeting, that it's not that the NDC has taken an entrenched position on these matters. You are open to other ideas on all that. Yes, I said so. I mean, and that's exactly why this you know, forum is important. Uh, the meeting of IPAC, consultations. I mean, several uh, groups of, uh, you know, um, shall I say civil society groups have also come forward with some proposals. You know, and we haven't seen those yet, but they're going to be made public to all of us. And then we can firmly say that this is the way forward. Chairman of the Electoral Commission, Charlotte Tose, announced at a media briefing that the outfit has, among others, contacted IT experts to look into claims of a bloated voters register. So far, as at uh, September 22nd deadline, we have received a little over 30 submissions. Now, as a commission, we are going to evaluate these proposals and we're also investigating the allegations which have been made by some political parties, especially when it touches on the integrity or the security of our IT systems. We are getting independent um, outside expertise to help us look into those allegations. But while we're doing that alongside, we are also evaluating all the submissions we've received, particularly submissions towards cleaning up of the register. And um, we're going to put a team together to look into this. The Electoral Commission is, however, set to hold a forum later in October to review the over 30 proposals presented on the voters' register. Meanwhile, General Secretary of the New Patriotic Party, Kwab Nature Pong, says the current posture of the NDC on the voters' register could be an indication that other parties are beginning to understand the main opposition party's demand for a new voters' role. No, 
Well, I think that all patriotic Ghanaians should recognize the fact that um, what the MPP has been saying is based on strong evidence and the fact that we want it for the good of the country. When we have a transparent system, a system that builds more public confidence, it inures to the benefit of the Ghanaian people. And, and I think that all the parties are beginning to realize that this is not an adversarial relationship. That we want to work together with the Electoral Commission, with all political parties. We are in this together. The fact that you have a new register does not mean that you win an election. But it builds a lot more confidence in the electoral process. And that's all we are asking for. And we are happy that everybody is recognizing that what we have said is based on some serious information. And everybody is prepared to have a dispassionate look at it. The NDC's current stance on this, you know, surprise does not surprise you at all. I, I don't know why you say it should. So it shouldn't surprise me. I, I do believe that the MP, NDC also means well for the country, like the MPP, um, and, and therefore this is a matter, it's a national issue, and that all of us should, our, our views should coincide. Now, investigative journalist Anasa Remiana has appeared on Wednesday before the Judicial Committee probing its corruption allegations against some judges and magistrates. It comes a day after an Accra High Court dismisses suit by some of the judges implicated in the scandal, challenging the committee's work. Felix Akoyam was in court and joins me with more on this. Good evening to you, uh, Felix. So, what happened in court today? Yeah. Um, um Israel, the Judicial Investigative Committee set up to probe the judicial bribery scandal involving, I mean, the judges and magistrates resumed certain after uh, Manakra High Court, you know, decided to dismiss the application that was yeah. filed against them. Anas and his team were in court today. It was a session that lasted for more than five hours because they arrived around 10.45 a.m. in the morning and we saw them coming out at about 5 p.m. and basically lawyers for three of the judges who have been implicated in this scandal cross-examined on us today. And uh, what, uh, what my understanding is that there, there, there was some interesting way or the manner in which Anas himself came to the premises was uh, quite interesting. Can you explain to us whatever? Very, very interesting and very strange as well. I mean, it was surprising to all of us who were there, I mean, and some of us even got confused identifying who the real Anas was because this time around he came in the same tundra that we see him, you know, driving often to the courts. Right, but so we have some of the photos actually on screen. Showing, now. and I mean, he had two other guys, this guy is just like himself, and so, I mean, it's very, very difficult for you to identify who the real Anas is. And I mean, I'm sure that Anas is just trying to still, you know, put, send a message out there that his identity, he is still going to try and conceal it. Because, yeah, typically what we we'll see is that there will be one person who's masked. Sure. And uh, even at that point, there were people who were saying, and I'm one of the people who were saying that, who knows, that probably wasn't Anas, and that he was just, a, that was just a decoy. So that person goes in and you're thinking that that's Anas, meanwhile, he may be walking with another these guys, probably dressed as a policeman. Ab absolutely. And so he had an interesting, uh, you know, it, this time around you had three people. Three people. And supposedly. And dress in the same manner it's very difficult for you to even you know right. differentiate between them but do you know how the proceedings went on one interesting thing is that i mean the lawyers for these judges were not were tight-lipped but one thing they confirmed to us is the fact that um, they cross-examined him and you know some lawyers for these judges wanted you know to sort of do away with analysis marks i mean make because they, I mean, they say that in court you can't come into court, you know, with a concealed identity. But indeed, um, the judges and I mean the panel sitting on this case still allowed Anas and his team to, you know, conceal their identity. And so even the cross examination that was done, they still had their identity identities con concealed. So My understanding is also is that the more than one person was uh, interrogated essentially. Uh, or cross-examined so that it wasn't just Anas but Anas and uh, the others who came in who did. Ab absolutely and I mean reading from the transcript that Anas posted on his Facebook page and even the video 
you would realize that he was not the only one who, you know, undertook this investigation. It was a teamwork. And so certainly the other people who, you know, were equally cross-examined are part of the Tiger IPI team. All right. Thank you very much, Felix Akoyam. And Felix Akoyam was there earlier at the Supreme Court where there were proceedings by the, or the Judicial Committee that's probing the uh, judicial corruption scandal resumed its work. Now, the, in other news, the National Association of Graduate Teachers in Agrat has agreed to give government more time to settle some allowances and grants owed its members. The reprieve should hold off a planned strike by the teachers to press home those demands. Matilda Omega has more. Earlier, the executives of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NACRADS, endorsed the planned strike by some of its members to demand the payment of incremental arrears, transfer grants, transport and other allowances. After meeting with officials from both the Education Ministry and the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, the president of NAGRAT, Christian Adaipuku, announced that government has up till October 10 to address the association's concerns. We have given government, we initially gave government up to the 10th, I mean the 30th of this month to resolve the issues and it ended today. But we have also served the National Labor Commission that by the 7th we, had, we were to begin our strike and that is what the regions have espoused. What has happened today means that we have given them three more days because we had seven days to begin. We are giving them three more days in addition to that because the Minister of Employment requested that we should give them 10 day moratorium to be able to resolve the issues. And we think that three days will not be too much for a union to give that concession. So we have given that concession hoping that the issues be, will be resolved by the 10th so that um, there will be no strike. What is happening now is that we don't seem to have the data. And that is why the unions have understood that go and get the data and let us all sit down and analyze and see where the problems are. The GES has promised that within five days they are going to meet their constituencies and make sure that they get that information. So we are dwelling on that hope that they will be able to do that. Um, Chief Executive has also um, pleaded that the Minister of Finance will be available next time to also brief us on outstanding incremental credit and other issues. So we think that giving government a concession of three more days to be able to resolve the issue will not be too much. So instead of the 7th that we were to start our action, we are pushing it to the 10th, hoping that, hoping that the issues will be resolved. Government, on the other hand, has promised in principle to pay incremental arrears to NAGRAT and the coalition of concerned teachers within the next 10 days. The director of the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission, George Smith Graham, says the finance ministry has already started processing the payments. We've had a discussions with them and we've all come to the realization that there are certain things that uh, had, had gone on and information had not flowed the way it's supposed to flow. And so we have given ourselves some time to work together to make sure that we get these issues uh, resolved. We have given ourselves uh, um, within a time frame to be able to resolve those issues. What is this time frame? I'm not, I'm not going to go into the technical uh, um, um, details of these issues, but I think um, as you can see from the room, we all know that there are issues that we have to resolve and uh, we'll resolve do, 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 those issues. It, it takes a, um, it's a shared responsibility. It takes the um, government, um, it takes uh, the Ghana Education Service, it takes uh, the unions to resolve these issues. And we have come to a realization that there are aspects that information has to flow, especially from the district level to the national, which also has not been done. And so we are all working to ensure that everybody sits up and, and do what they are supposed to do. You're watching Join News Prime. We're taking a break, but before we go, President Joe Mahama has commented publicly for the first time on the corruption scandal that has tainted Ghana's justice delivery system. In a post on his Facebook page, which I'm going to go uh, straight on to, the president pleaded with Ghanaians to maintain their faith in the judiciary despite the bribery controversy. So he goes, I always supported and will always support the rule of law in our justice system. What we uncovered these days is that some people, judges, judicial officers, and policemen seem to be willing to transgress the principles of a fair justice to their own interest. 
such persons should be subjected to what they perhaps denied others, a fair investigation and a fair trial. Sometimes the principles are to be relearned the hard way because justice should always be served. And I'll skip to the very last paragraph. It says, I urge every one of you to keep faith in the system. Justice will always prevail. It's available on the, the president's Facebook page. So you can actually get to his Facebook page and get to read all of it. Otherwise, we're also going to be making, av making it available on our Facebook page, Joy News. The president has also been addressing the UN General Assembly, and we have that also coming up for you in the bulletin station. It's now time for business news, and Abigail Adumaku is here. Good evening to you, Abigail. Good evening. What's coming Israel. up in business? Well, we are talking about oil production, okay. and we should be excited because very soon we'll How about gas? The <sighs> shortage? Well, not too much of a good news there because it's going to linger for a while. Well, those are some suggestions that we are getting, and we'll be uh, delving into why that is so. All right. Right, so we'll take it away and of course we'll talk about the uh, vessel that will be used to produce, store and offload crude oil from the Trinibua Enyora in Tom 10 oil field. Now getting ready to set sail from Juan Singapore shipyard to Ghana. This will happen after formal ceremony which is currently ongoing in Singapore to name the vessel after late President John Evans at Tamils. But as George Yaffe reports, this could fast track processes for commercial production of crude oil at 10. FBSO John Evans at Tamils is expected to arrive in Ghana by March next year. This will pave the way for commercial production of crude oil at the country's second biggest oil field to start by June next year. The vessel will have the capacity to, to produce 80,000 barrels of crude oil a day and a storage capacity of 1.7 million barrels of crude oil. Daily production at the 10 field was started at around 20,000 barrels and eventually increased to 80,000 by the end of 2016. This would improve the country's total crude oil production to about 160,000 barrels and eventually reach 200,000 barrels by 2017. Another good news is that the light sweet crude that the field will be producing is seen by many of high grade or premium quality, which will mean that the 10 crude will be getting a good price from a lot of buyers. Asia is already seen as a major market for the crude oil from Ghana. However, the concern is that with forecast that crude oil prices could be declining further in the coming years, there are some who are worried about the fortunes of the 10 in the Ghibli field in the coming years when it comes to getting good prices for their crude oil. Government is also hoping to get about $2 billion in revenue alone from the 10 field and expects about $20 billion in investment in the oil sector for the next five years. Let's go on to gas now and the current shortage of liquefied petroleum gas could last a while longer despite the release of some gas onto the market by the Terma Oil Refinery. The refinery should, by the close of today, release about 4,500 gas onto the market. However, checks by Joy Business indicates that this might be enough, uh, might not be enough to meet the total demand on the market. Let's do more analysis on this issue and I have on the phone the former chief executive of the National Petroleum Authority, John Atefwa. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Now, what do you make of suggestions that the gas shortage could last for a while? Um, can I can I can you raise your voice a bit? It wasn't too clear. I'm asking what you make of the suggestions that gas shortage could last for a while. Um, it was something that was due to happen because I think we have all glossed over an underlying problem, which is likely to bite us very hard as we go uh, as um, that, uh, what, as things go on. You know, government owes 
the BDC a lot of money as a result of the exchange rate depreciation. But I think government is refusing to settle this amount. And it's causing problems to the banks. And therefore, the banks are not establishing the LPs for the DDC to bring in their LPs. And remember, our refinery is not produced. So all the gas we are consuming is coming from import. Therefore, if we don't find money immediately to pay these people so that they can establish LPs, and get confirmation by the uh, uh, corresponding bank, we may be in for a very long winter. I see. So um, the issue is only about the finances? Yeah, that's, that's all. It's all about finances. I don't think it's about storage, as some people are saying. Listen, if it is about storage, does it mean our storage tanks are all full or they are empty? If they are empty, why are they empty? Because if they, they have if we have stuff in the storage tank, we will be selling them now. Right. We, we owe the we owe the industry. The industry is indebted to the bank to the tune of about five hundred million dollars. Now, this amount, if you look at the capitalization of our bank, when they begin to provision for this amount, I'm not sure any of the banks will survive. And therefore, it's a very serious national problem that the Ministry of Finance, the Bank of Ghana, and the banks and the BDCs have to sit down and reconcile and uh, find modalities to resolve. Otherwise, it can affect it. And if we are not careful, it will also go into the... Uh, now we are dealing with LPG. We may find the same issue with... Regardless of our gas either. production? Regardless? Well... Well, I mean, well, that can solve a bit of it, but really, yeah, but if we don't deal with this problem, it can hurt us and hurt us really bad. Oh, yeah. A special court set up by the Judicial Service to help clamp down on electricity theft has jailed 104 consumers who illegally tapped power from the Electricity Company of Ghana. Director of Customer Services at the ECG, Kwabna Atta Forcing, says a special house-to-house -house operation launched two months ago has identified hundreds of illegal power thieves who are also facing prosecution. The theft cut across all spheres of life. People in manufacturing, people in the houses, people in the small scale business all engage in their thefts. The arrests we normally make cut across. And it's also seen in every district, every town. This actually demonstrates that it's a subject being uh, perpetrated in all the regions and towns so across, the country. across the country. I see. So uh, how are you dealing with it? Uh, you showed figures of what you've done as yeah. pilot in Greater Accra alone yeah. for the last two months. No, and the, yeah. the figures we show is not only Greater Accra. Uh, what, what we've done, we launched it in Greater Accra as a key subject here, but it's been run concurrently in all other regions. So, so far in the two months that you've run it, yes. uh, what have you found? We have we demonstrated that 36,000 visited, about uh, some 36, I don't have the figures here, but for the number we have visited, over 36,000 homes and industries, we have been able to bring at least the, about 5 million, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, ganesses that uh, we showed there. It has been the revenue that has been generated. In terms of gigawatts, over 2.1 million uh, gigawatts, and this this is big. Uh, Which means all along people were stealing. Uh, yes, yeah, not that so something was not being done. This revenue position it didn't start only from uh, February. We have only amplified it. When we saw the extent of the theft, they said to increase the coverage. Uh, there are a lot of technologies to track, track to be able to identify that the, the, the person has done illegality to through metering. But uh, what we launched in August. Came as a result of the fact that we saw that only through metering analysis or anti tampering mechanisms, you will not be able to identify all the thefts. So we decided to go from house to house. So we decided to increase the number of uh, employ some consultants and some the private sector to assist us to uncover some of these things. So it's not that we didn't know, but the magnitude of which we are doing now, we have increased the tempo. So we'll be able to enter every house. Sometimes we were hopping from here to there to be able to identify them. But when you saw that the marketing was growing, people were not stopping. Uh, first, we decided to apply for a special court, which we had it. 
then we decide to go from house to house to be able to identify the illegality. So as we speak, we have special calls that deal with ECG yes, or yes. power theft cases? Power theft cases only, on, on, uh, especially for ECG, no any other case. And uh, through our the data of legal service, uh, we had this uh, comfort from the judicial service, probably the chief justice give us special courts where uh, every Saturday this thing is done. How many convictions so far? As I done, even when you started from uh, the August, yeah. you've prosecuted 104. Out of 136 uh, people who have been identified as uh, the corporates, you have prosecuted by 104. It is still ongoing. Almost every Saturday, the other courts. What would be the advice to consumers, since some of these problems will not be their own uh, doing? Every consumer, be you, myself, or any other person, must be aware that you enter every house, every fraternity, be it a house, be it a shop, be it an industry. ECG staff, consultant will enter your premises. So you are, people are advised that anybody who has got a notion of perpetuating legal, illegality like this will one day be arrested. And when you are arrested, you go through our, 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 our process. You search you with the illegality, you process it to court, and they publish your name in the papers to shame you. So it's going to every house. So nobody can run away from this. Yes, we've not gotten there, but you are getting there. So colleagues, both women and men are reminded that this is not a one-day wonder a job. It's not going to be a thing of the past. It's going to continue as an additional integral part of our operations. So if you don't go to your house, be minded that you one day you will get there. So if anybody should pop into your house to ask that, he will give you a meter, he will temper with the meter, please resist it and report him to the nearest ECG office. President Joe Mahama has impressed on world leaders to more seriously consider cleaner energy options to help secure the very existence of the human race. Addressing the UN General Assembly in New York, President Mahama highlighted the rather skewed relationship between developed and developing nations and called on all countries of the world to work together to promote human security. I wish to state quite emphatically at the start of my address that it is time for greater inclusivity in the United Nations. Truth be told, it is long past time. The world that was in 1945 does not exist now in 2015. So the visionary organization that was formed to meet the needs of that world must now be reformed to meet the needs of today's world. We've had a fruitful General Assembly. We adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. We discussed how to establish resilient health systems. We held a summit on peacekeeping. And we also strategized on how to deal with religious extremism. For me, one remarkable image that made a huge impression on me in the early days of this gathering was a Pope's car. It was breathtaking to watch the pontiff as he greeted massive crowds and moved even government officials to tears in an open gallery. But nothing was more breathtaking than watching him entering and being driven through the streets of New York in a tiny Fiat 500. There was a strange sense of solidarity that I felt with this small vehicle as I watched it cruising down the streets of New York, surrounded and dwarfed by such humongous sports utility vehicles. It reminded me of the plight of the so-called developing nations in our relationships with the wealthier, larger, more established nations of this world. There is a sense of being protected, yet also of being overpowered, of being guided, and yet also of being intimidated to stay the course that they are navigating. What struck me was the modernity of the moment. The survival of our planet depends on us coming to terms with such modernity. It requires us to redefine our relationship with nature and to realize that we're just one part of a larger ecosystem. We must finally realize that it is we who are dependent upon nature and not the other way around. One of the major binding constraints that all of Africa faces is a shortage of electric power, and Ghana is no exception. In many African nations, power outages as a result of a shortfall in generation are even considered normal. In Ghana, two decades of consistent positive growth has resulted in demand for power outstripping supply. The resulting load management program has unfortunately slowed growth and is taking a steep toll on economic and social life. 
for watching join news from we're taking a break when we come back we bring you international news Nigeria's President Muhammadu Buhari has said he intends to remain in personal control of the oil ministry as he pursues an anti-corruption campaign. He won elections in March partly on his tough stance on corruption and has vowed to... Now, parts of the eastern regional capital, Kofuidu, are submerged under floodwaters following a few hours of torrential rain. Correspondent Edwin Kofi Sian joins us on the phone line with more. Good evening to you, Edwin. Hello, Kofi. If you can hear me, how bad is the situation in Kofuidu tonight? Well, uh, it, the rain started around, let me say, uh, 3 p.m., and it lasted for about two hours. So it was until 5 p.m. that they stopped. And you could see from places like uh, the Abroa and Guanta Junction, where most mechanics have their shops located. And also, it has to, it's also close to the regional office of the Ghana National Fire Service. Then you move from there to Insuka, where uh, mostly it, it become an annual, uh, let me say, ritual, because whenever uh, it rains every year, that place is also displaced. And so far, I can tell you that places like Asokore and also part of Efijasi here in Kofuridia are also submitted. And people have lost their items as a result of their flooding. Uh, some are also displaced and they are not able to sleep in their houses this evening. How much of Kofuridia would you say has been affected? 10%, 20%? Well, for now, uh, I should say about <laughs> uh, say about two percent of of it, because oh. it, it just places like uh, Abruwan, Kwanta, Insukwao, Efijase, and Asokore. Right. Uh, any okay? Any help coming through for those in distress? Well, I at the time of leaving the place, the regional NADMO coordinator, Mr. Rans for the Usubuache, had told me he and his men were on their way to the place and it was getting late so we had to leave all right thank you very much uh Kofusian, joining us from kofuidia where there's been flooding Right, it's time for entertainment and Miss G is here. Good evening to you, Miss G. Good evening, Nijal. How are you? Very well, thank you. Okay, that's good. <laughs> now, you have a, a number of stories coming up for yes, you. I'm, I'm just going to run through them quickly. So, there's something on No Tribe. Uh -huh. There's uh, something on uh, Kofi Filippo. Yeah. And then Women Crash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what's coming up in that. But let's start with No Tribe. What's up, what's up with No Tribe? Well, easy. I can tell you for a fact that the winners of the Gospel Award this year, which is No Tribe, have not received the award yet and they've been threatening the organizers uh, of the award excuse me so why do they have this photograph behind you okay so that's the why photograph they doing of this you and you know when i came here i almost called you i almost called you miss bell why because i saw bra lie and miss bell is trending <laughs> okay she's trending because I can't because I can't even use the picture. Is it trending because of this photograph? I, I, no. Oh, is you wish she was trending because of this photograph? She's trending because of an extraordinary photograph. You know she is Madame Controversy, and now you see her in what we say the White House, and she is opening up everything and taking a picture of everything, and we see something that looks like a V thing. You don't mean it. I'm telling you, and that's how come I can't show the photograph. <laughs> So that's your, 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 your you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna get people rushing to Miss Bell's page to go and see. Exactly. So it's on an Instagram it's page. It's on an you Instagram mean? page. You know, don't just go look for Bradley. You just go see Miss Bell as well doing her thing. You know, she has a V-like thing okay. there waiting let, for you. Let, let's come. Let's come back to uh, <laughs> no, no track. 
the picture with this, her. This photograph was actually taking um, a Sally's wedding celebration. Yes, uh, Miss Bell and I we go we we go back. Yes, there, because your bra lie, your bra lie. The the one who was chasing the sixteen year old girl. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's what she says. No, 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 no. We 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 actually did a, we performed a song bra lie together on stage at some point. In time. And then you represented that bra lie. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you actually were chasing, you're chasing some 16 year old. Yeah. <laughs> but let's come no back tribe. to. No tribe. Yes, no tribe. And they are yet to receive the awards from the organizers of this year's Music Awards, and they've been threatening to sue them. Why is it taking so long, actually? Well, let's get to hear the story. <laughs> No Tribe won this year's Gospel Artist of the Year Award at the VGMA and was supposed to be awarded a branded Ghanaian-made Katanga car, but have still not received as promised. I quote, we were promised a Katanga car, but we are yet to receive it. Anytime we ask for it, we are being told to be patient. Now our patience is running out. We are giving up war. Katanga, all the organizers of the VGMA two weeks to deliver our car to us, else we shall advise ourselves. No tribe noted in a recent interview. But information gathered by the entertainment team reveals that technicians working on the car are still fixing the doors, which they've promised to hand over the car to the organizers of the VGMA upon completion within this week. <laughs> We're taking a break, but that's it for entertainment. We'll have uh, sports coming up there after. Please don't go away. All right, it's time for sports now. And Gary R. Smith is here. Good evening to you, Gary. Hello, Izzy. Yeah. Okay, so one of the very interesting stories that uh, went out to today has to do with the Black Queen's stay at M Plaza Hotel. Apparently, you've yeah. done some analysis on it. I'd like you to walk me through the analysis. So if you get onto my Joy Online, actually, the story is there. So nine-day Black Queen strike at M Plaza Hotel cost taxpayer $37,000. A cool $37,000. That's a lot of money. That's not cool no, at that's all. Cool, my that's brother. A, that's a lot of money. Oh, it's so one. You go on, you go on by saying, so how much are they supposed to be getting what? Uh, $5,000 each. $5,000 each. Yeah. And $37,000 of that is already gone. So the breakdown it. is easy. So you know there were 20 players, yeah. 8 officials, so 28. Each was charged $150 per room because it's a four-star hotel at the airport residential area. $150 is actually cheap. It's quite cheap. That was a discount rate Okay. for the sports ministry. You know, pack, pack, pack like that. <laughs> so yeah, $150 times nine days for each person. That comes to $1,350. So each person was paying $1,350 times the 28. You get just over $37,000, um, 800 Okay? That's $7,800. But the hotel was magnanimous enough to give them a discount. And so it came up to $37,000. <laughs> now, <laughs> so, okay, so this $37,000 that we could have avoided paying. Yes, if planning had been done. Somebody should be fired. Somebody for should be fired. But you see, Brad John doesn't fire people. You know, Brad John? <laughs> the I'm, big man. Cool. Oh, God, the top. All right, carry on people. So that's one of the stories you can find on myjoyonline.com for slash sport. Thank you, Easy, for that intro. I'm Gary Al Smith with the sports, but we begin with news from Hearts of Oak, who we understand are going to name a substantive head coach soon. Don't forget that they sacked their head coach last season, Herbert Addo, after 21 games because Hearts of Oak weren't doing well. They got a substantive stopgap in the goalkeeper's trainer, Eddie Ansa. That didn't work out. They got another Turkish trainer that didn't work out, and they are looking for a new man. I have about uh, 10 candidates who have applied for that, including our own standing coach, Eddie Ansan. We are considering all of them. The, the, the board subcommittee will meet and then take a decision on who 
becomes a substantive goal for the club. Looking at the job he did in the absence of your, you know, your coach, does it look like he can land the job? It is possible. It is possible. Eddie Ansel can land the job as a head coach, but then there's a process that he has to go through, and there are criteria that have been set for uh, assessment. And for that reason, we expect that when the documents are put down, you know, he should be able to go through. Gerald Ankara is the general manager of Hearts of Folk. Still on the club, the Phobians are set to sign strategically. Uh, we understand they are able to get players for the next Premier League season. Don't forget, they finished fourth in the last one. Definitely, we are going to sign some more on, but we are not going to do any mass recruitment. What we are going to do are to sign on strategic players for certain positions because we have quite a young team. They are playing well. Maybe well, what, I can, what I can say for now is that we are only left to the finishing. And for that reason, that's where we'll look at most. Right, from Hearts of Hope, we go up to the Ghana Football Association who say that their focus on building pitches to develop the game is something they'll be looking out for in the next four years. We will be hearing from George Efriye, who has been newly elected onto the executive committee of the Ghana Football Association. The president outlined his vision um, when he was uh, re-elected uh, in Tamale. Um, the areas where he mentioned were like um, improving infrastructure. It is one area where I think that we need to pay particular attention about it. One, let, let's even look at Pram Pram. If you go to Pram Pram, we have all the nice buildings there. But the turf, football is played on the turf. But the turfs we have there, or the pitches we have in Pram Pram, are in deplorable states. So I think that we need to pay particular attention to the turf and the training pitches in Pram Pram, even if we can build more because almost all our national teams apart from the black stars use pram pram and we all know that if the government can even afford to put the teams in hostels and in hotels you, they still need a place to play football and training pitches in this country is a problem the whole country my name is gary al smith That's it for the bulletin. Before we go, a quick run through our top stories. A new patriotic party and others pushing for the compilation of the new voters' register may yet see their wish come true as the Electoral Commission has tasked IT experts to review it. And the governing National Democratic Congress is also softening its stance on the matter. Lawyers for judges implicated in judicial corruption scandal cross examining Anas Aramia and Anas as the Judicial Committee resume, resumes its work. Part of Eastern Region capital, Kofoidia submerged after a few hours of torrential rain. Thank you very much for watching on behalf of the team. I wish you a good night. is Joy News Prime.